going to continue along with our program right after this quick Zoom tutorial since we do have people joining in Zoom and on YouTube. So we like to review how you should view the best way to view. And so please remember to remain muted and to keep your videos off. We do have closed captioning available if that is something that is helpful to you. So you can select closed captions, show subtitles, and then I went too fast for that one. This is what your subtitles will look like. And then you'll select speaker view so that you can see the speaker alongside the presentation. And that's the next one that you'll select side by side mode. And you can drag your screen bigger or smaller depending on what you need to see. And then because we are engaging through chat today, we always like to remind everybody to please be a good digital citizen. So stay on topic with your questions and comments, be respectful and kind, and we welcome your questions and your comments throughout the program today. And we will be saving questions towards the end. So don't feel like we're ignoring you, we'll just get to them towards the end. And so with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and introduce myself and introduce our guest speaker for today. My name is Martha Fisk and I'm an educator with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And today we are joined by Dr. Kristen Bagley and she is a veterinary resident at Laboratory Animal Medicine. She acts as a volunteer for an organization called BRAD and her interests include ultrasound imaging, animal welfare, neuroscience and teaching. She is passionate about promoting public understanding of science and research, which is where she joins us today and sharing some of this passion with us. So we're so excited that you could join us today. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to you and you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. Perfect, that sounds great. Okie dokie, let me get this. Alrighty, can you see that all right? Yes, just uh, when, the, yep, perfect. Excellent. So thank you so much for having me speak to y'all today. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to present on this topic. So um, as Martha said, I'm, I'm a veterinarian. Um, and when I went to veterinary school, you know, I am, of course, really interested in improving animal health, animal welfare. But I was also really interested in, in human health, too, and sort of how we can, you know, study all different kinds of animals and be able to improve um, both human health and, and animal health. Um, that's something that really, really interests me. And so by promoting science, by promoting research, that's how we can improve um, medicine. That's how we can come up with all kinds of better understanding of diseases. And that's how we can come up with better treatments. So in honor of Bugfest, I am going to be giving a lecture today on how fruit flies and other bugs keep people and pets healthy. Um, so uh, as Martha mentioned, I volunteer for an organization called BRAD. BRAD stands for Biomedical Research Awareness Day. And coincidentally, today is BRAD. So I am super excited to be celebrating both Bugfest and Brad on the same day. It's a great day for that. Um, and to do that, that's of course where I'm merging those two interests together. I've been, uh, also for context, I've been a volunteer for Bugfest for the past like 10 years. And so I'm, I'm really excited to be continuing that annual tradition. And then even before that, I, I'm from the Raleigh area. And so I've gone to so many Bugfests, more Bugfests than I can count. <laughs> So what is BRAD that I keep mentioning? It's Biomedical Research Awareness Day. And the purpose of this day is to educate people about the role that animals play in the development of new treatments and cures um, for people and animals. So promoting both animal health and, and human health. Um, the purpose of this day is also to pr promote support for the compassionate care of the animals that are needed in, in research, and to also just highlight all the different career opportunities that are available for anyone who is interested in this field. So the basis for uh, this discussion today, uh, we can't have this discussion without talking about One Health. One Health is the idea, it is this approach um, that brings together people from a lot of different disciplines, but it is an approach that 
recognizes really that the health of people is really interconnected with both the health of animals and our environment. And the discipline that I'm really in is, is called translational medicine or comparative medicine. And what this means is that I'm really interested in studying how both the biological similarities and the biological differences among species, um, how understanding these differences and similarities can help us understand the mechanisms of both human and animal disease. And to better illustrate this concept, we'll be talking about a bunch of different sort of animal models and how their similarities and differences help us uh, promote human health. So these are some of the examples of the creatures that we will be discussing today. Game plan for today. We're gonna to be talking about fruit flies as was mentioned in my title, um, but also we'll be talking about a, a species called C. elegans. We'll be talking about planaria, mosquitoes, honeybees, and then at the very end, I've got just a little snippet of probably the weirdest thing that I've ever heard about, like that we discussed in veterinary school. Oh man, it's, it's gonna be great. I'm super excited and let's get started. So why in the world do we study fruit flies? Fruit flies, they, they're super different than people. How can what is happening in a fruit fly tell us anything about what is happening in people? Well, guess what? Fruit flies share about 60% of the same DNA that people have. Additionally, about 75% of the genes that cause diseases in humans have sort of a, a similar counterpart in fruit flies. Now, the advantage of fruit flies is that fruit flies, especially for genetics research, they, can, they reproduce really quickly. In about three to four weeks, like a month or so, you have uh, multiple generations, like these flies will become grandparents. So that is super um, advantageous for studying genetic characteristics that are inherited. Uh, additionally, they're really small and very easy to care for. You can maintain very large populations. I was seeing a statistic that was like, you can have the population of London equivalent on a bench top, right? Just in little jars. They're super easy, low maintenance, easy to feed, easy to take care of. Uh, and they are used to help us understand neuroscience, cancer, addiction, circadian rhythms, learning, stem cells, dietary research, and, and so much more. These are an award-winning bug. When I say that, yes, we can study amazing things in fruit flies, I am talking about six Nobel Prizes that have been awarded based on the groundbreaking biological work that has uh, resulted from work with fruit flies. So these bugs have been started, like research with them has been going on since the 1930s, like almost a hundred years since that first Nobel prize right there. Um, and so basically they were the ones who discovered that uh, chromosomes are really important for um, heredity uh, uh, and like the inheritance of certain traits. Um, let's see, other ones that are super interesting are the, the under, our understanding of the olfactory or our sense of smell um, from fruit, fruit flies. Uh, additionally, we've learned more about like uh, animal development um, and genetics and the control of that through them. And then also we understand like the immune system better by studying fruit flies. So super interesting bugs. The most recent one is about circadian rhythms, which um, control basically our um, uh, internal biological clock. Okay, so in discussing fruit flies, we cannot proceed any further. This is how I want to celebrate both Brad and Bug Fest. When I go to a party, people typically ask me, Kristen, what is your favorite band? What is your favorite TV show? No one asks me, what is your favorite gene? Well, guess what? I'm going to tell you all this today. Um, so my favorite gene is a gene called Sonic Hedgehog. Yes, that is the literal name of this gene. And we're gonna talk about its origin story right now and how, we, how this really vague biological concept got this very odd name. So uh, in flies, in our, in our fruit fly model, um, they have a gene that's called uh, the hedgehog gene. And so basically when scientists were first discovering like, huh, what do these genes do? They, and this was back in the seventies, they did this really crude approach where they would just like destroy a gene and see what happens. And what happened for the fruit flies is that when they destroyed and deleted this specific gene in them, they found, and you can see in the diagram on the right, they found that these fly embryos developed like all these different kinds of spikes, like all unorganized over their, their body. This uh, denticle lawn is what it, what it 
they've termed it. But uh, they thought that this looked kind of like a hedgehog. And so like the way that they have all the spikes all over their bodies. And so they named this gene hedgehog. Well, turns out hedgehog is incredibly important. Very, very, very important. So um, sonic hedgehog is the mammalian, one of the mammalian versions of hedgehogs. There's a couple different hedgehog genes. Um, but sonic hedgehog is, is one of probably the most important of the hedgehog genes. Um, and it plays important roles in brain development, uh, development of limbs, so your arms, legs, fingers, uh, as well as your teeth and lungs. And then interestingly, abnormalities in the hedgehog signaling pathway have been associated with cancers. So what's really useful is that we can develop targeted treatments um, for these kinds of conditions based on our understanding of the players in this pathway. So silly name, but super duper important. And the scientists who were naming this like gene and this at the, at the time um, didn't know any of that. They're just like, oh, this is a cool gene. Let's name it after our favorite hedgehog, Sonic the Hedgehog, because this was the 1980s and that was when it was peak popular. Um, but to bring this back into veterinary relevance, there are some um, toxic plants that and chemical compounds that are associated with and will disrupt uh, sonic hedgehog signaling. So this plant here is what's known as the California corn lily um, or Veratrum californicum or whatever. Um, and so when sheep consume this plant while they are pregnant, their lambs are going to be formed with very severe developmental abnormalities. So the chemical compound that is found in the Veratrum plants is a compound called cyclopamine. And basically what this does is that it, sonic hedgehog cannot work properly when this compound is present. And so what happens is the lambs are um, basically born with only one eye in the center of their forehead. And they've got severe brain abnormalities such that their brain, you know how it's normally split into these two separate cerebral hemispheres. Well. Those hemispheres don't develop. It just is one structure, one uniform thing with that no division there. And so I, there are some really graphic and really disturbing images associated with this. Google at your own risk. Like if you don't want to see that, don't look it up. That's why I didn't put it in here. The goal is not to make anyone, anyone cry or give anyone nightmares today. Um, we're going to have a, a happy celebration here. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that, yes, this is super relevant and definitely a, a problem clinically. Okay, next bug, I wanna talk about C. elegans. The moral of the C. elegans story is the beauty and value in keeping it simple. Why do we study C. elegans? C. elegans is this like, uh, basically this really, really, really tiny worm. When I say really tiny, I mean like a millimeter in length right here. And uh, the importance of this creature is that because it is so small, because it is so simple, this allows us to really easily understand, just like take out all the extra complicating factors and really get down and understand the molecular biology. This was the first multicellular organism to have its whole genome sequenced. And this is the only organism out there that has its connectome, which is basically the um, map of the nervous system, the neuronal, like how the nervous system is wired. Um, that's the only species where we fully understand that there. So this one is also an award-winning bug. Um, it's won three Nobel Prizes. And my favorite Nobel Prize that it has won is um, basically it was critical for our understanding and development of green fluorescent protein or GFP. Um, so there's pictures on the left-hand side right here. One of them, the bottom one is showing you the like protein structure of this protein. And, and the top one is um, showing you how this protein fluoresces underneath a, a special kind of microscope. And this is super cool. I have used GFP in some of the science that I have done, basically where we're using it to tag and label things. So what I have done is when I wanted to look for like a specific kind of cell or a specific like kind of protein, what I will do is then like, basically the GFP is this glowing little light up tag thing. And through my experiments and protocols, I can make those cells and the protein that I wanna see glow in the dark. And it is awesome. Next organism that I wanna talk about are planaria. These 
um, flatworms right here are super duper cute. I love their little eye spots right here. They look like they're these little cartoon characters. Oh, so adorable. But what makes them really special and incredible is that they have this amazing ability to regenerate lost body parts. So literally, if you cut a planaria in half, they will form two separate individuals there. And what's amazing about this is that, you know, when we think about um, disease processes and when we think about like organ damage, for the most part, depending on the organ that you're talking about, like if that gets damaged, there's only so much that we can do to fix it. Like if your brain gets damaged, if your heart gets damaged, if your kidneys get damaged, that's a problem. Like they don't regenerate um, with the exception of some other like limited circumstances. But what they do is they develop like scar tissue there. And so it would be super cool if they could regenerate and it would be super cool if you could just make all the body parts that you needed to if they were to get damaged. So that's why we're super interested in how in the world do they do that? Um, they're also a model for aging research because um, basically they have this limitless uh, regenerative capacity. Um, they are known for being immortal under the edge of a knife. I thought that was a strange phrase. <laughs> and also, they've been to space, which I think is wild. I've not been to space. How come these worms have been to space and I've not? Um, there's a paper that I found that shows some interesting studies about what happens to them and like how uh, their biology changes like when they've gone to space, which I just thought was really interesting. Okay, next bug that we are going to talk about today, we're gonna to talk about mosquitoes. So I'm sure you are all familiar with certain kinds of mosquitoes out there. And you're probably pretty darn on familiar with the fact that mosquitoes carry many different diseases. Mosquitoes are what is known, are what is known as a vector. So a vector is a living organism that can transmit an infectious agent or infectious disease from one living creature to another one. Um, so this can be from humans to humans, from animals to humans, or from animals to other animals. And so these are some examples of the different diseases that um, mosquitoes can, can transmit. Um, malaria being probably the most significant one on this, this list here. The, the global disease burden from malaria is quite shocking and, and alarming. And so um, that's just one of them, but there's also chingunya, canine heartworm, dengue, yellow fever, uh, lymphatic laryiasis. Um, so these are gonna be like uh, protozoal diseases. They are viruses. Um, let's see, we've got our equine uh, encephalitis viruses as well as St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile virus, and Zika virus. So uh, if you're interested in any of these infectious diseases, honestly, the CDC website is the best resource. Like it is so thorough, really complete, really just accessible, good stuff. You're going to get a description of the disease symptoms, the, the geographic distribution of this disease, the way it is transmitted, how you diagnose it, how you treat it, and how you prevent it. Also, I love to travel. And so before I go anywhere, <laughs> I'm checking the CDC website to make sure like, okay, I gotta get my yellow fever vaccine. Oh, I need to take antimalarials. Like it's so easy to get that information on there. But one of the things that really struck me too was that the CDC website also has a lot of um, just personal stories about pe the impact of you know these different diseases have on, on people's lives. Um, and they do a good job of talking about the specific things that they are doing, the researchers they are doing to prevent um, these diseases and just about like the history of the disease burden in the United States. And so it's, it's really quite remarkable to think about like, wow, things were, things were tough many decades ago. This, yeah, this disease that we no longer see, see really today, um, that it is considered to be pretty rare. No, no, that, that was common place many decades ago. And so it's, it's truly remarkable and it makes me feel quite grateful um, how far we've come. Uh, and biomedical research allows us to continue to make progress. Like that's the beauty of science. That's the beauty of research and medicine is that we can always do better. And so again, infinite opportunity there. 
Um, I also just highly recommend checking out the malaria information. It's great. So why are we studying these mosquitoes? Like, don't we care about the disease in people? Don't we care about the disease in animals? Shouldn't we study them? No, we should also study the mosquito because by understanding the natural history, life cycle, behavior, reproduction, and just basic biology of all of them can help us understand how these different diseases may spread. And additionally, we might be able to understand, you know, like, okay, how can we intervene if we know that the mosquitoes like to go here, they live here, this is how they act during this time of the day. We can use those, all that information we can use to develop specific targeted interventions. One other thing that's important to note when we talk about, you know, their life cycle and geographic distribution, climate change is going to have a serious impact on the spread of these vectors. And we need to understand how this is going to impact the spread of disease. And so understanding, so what's interesting about vectors is that these animals are not just like mechanical. So there's a difference between mechanical vectors and biological vectors. And I'll, I'll discuss that right now. So a mechanical vector is something that is just like taking blood, like just the blood itself from one animal and then injecting it into another. A biological vector actually provides like a safe sort of home and harbors the, the the um, infectious agent like inside them. So like the infectious agent is actually growing and thriving inside of the mosquito. And so that's why it's super important to understand like, how does that happen? What is it about the mosquito that makes this a happy home for malaria? And, and if we can understand that, then maybe there's an, a way that we can prevent that or, or change something about that so that we can present, pre prevent the spread of these infectious diseases. And so I want to um, just go into a little bit more. I, I have to do this. The veterinarian in me cannot leave this lecture today without telling you, please, like getting on the soapbox right now. We have to talk about heartworm disease. Um, everyone, please understand this. The prevention for this disease is so much better than the treatments. And um, it's so much better than when this disease progresses and when it gets to the point where we can't treat it. So just so that you are aware, North Carolina, hot spot for heartworm disease. Tons of mosquitoes everywhere. Um, same with just the, the Southeast in general. Um, but heartworm disease is present in all 50 states. And so really, again, just to further hit this point home, um, this doesn't just break like, you know, your dog's heart. It, it, it was gonna break yours too. Like I, I've seen that happen. And then that's why I'm, I'm giving you this talk right now. It's very serious. Um, but just remember 12 and 12, it's totally, totally preventable. Give your heartworm prevention 12 months out of the year and get your pet tested for heartworm disease every 12 months. My kitty cat gets her, her heartworm prevention every single month. So the natural host is going to be the dog and they will get um, up to 300 actual adult worms inside of their heart. It is shocking. Um, cats, on the other hand, can also get heartworm disease too. And they only get, you know, one to maybe three worms total, but they, the disease that they get is predominantly, um, manifests as like lung problems and problems with breathing. And so it is really, really scary when, it, when a cat gets heartworm disease. Um, so both dogs and cats, keep them on your prevention. And unfortunately, there's many different options. There are oral chewables, there are injectables, there are topicals. And I just want to say and emphasize on this slide, that your heartworm prevention is for your dog. Not for you, it's for your dog, okay? So don't, don't tell me that you want to, want to eat the little chewable heart guard because you love that beefy flavor and that soft texture. No, no, no. Get a Slim Jim and talk to your physician if you have any personal medical concerns. But keep your pets on heartworm prevention year round. Okay, um, next slide, we're gonna talk about honeybees. So I can't finish this talk or not include the honeybees in this lecture. And they are so cool. Honestly, like honeybee medicine 
is actually becoming a, like a newly developing kind of sector of veterinary medicine. And it's something that I definitely want to want to read up more about and everything. We don't get very much of that in our curriculum, but it's really, really interesting. And I think veterinarians can potentially, you know, help out and play a role there if you have that, that interest. So um, the way that I first thought about honeybees and how they help me in my life is that we use medical grade Manuka honey for wound healing. It's amazing stuff. So honey contains multiple antimicrobials in it. And so this is amazing because uh, another really big problem that we are facing, like a, this is a public health issue, um, is antimicrobial resistance. The antibiotics that we have more and more bacteria are becoming resistant to them, as in they are not working and not doing their job and not killing the bacteria. And that's a big problem. We need to, it's like this arms race, right? We need to come up with and discover more antimicrobials, but we also need to be really careful and cautious about how we're using them so that we're not promoting that. I could give a whole nother lecture about this, so I'll, I'll keep it brief for now. But honey, honey is an important tool that we can use to, to, uh, fight against this because it's really great. It works against these um, bacteria that are resistant to multiple antibiotics. And what's special about the Manuka or medical grade honey is that it contains this special compound called methylglycosol um, that gives it just this extra boost in its antimicrobial abilities over like other, other kinds of honeys. Um, what's interesting too, is that honey is this like uh, really, uh, like hyper osmolarity kind of solution to like, as in like, it's really, really concentrated when it comes to like the chemical structure of it. Like it's just, it's got a lot of osmols in it. And what that means is that this is going to help it be both antimicrobial and it's also going to be um, anti-inflammatory. So it's gonna wick out that moisture from any sort of swollen wound and help it, help it heal significantly better. Um, and so ultimately you're going to have just better, faster tissue healing and reduce scarring. Um, okay. This is my last topic that I want to tell you all about. And just so you know, it might be a little gross. So close your eyes, plug your ears if you have to, and then you can join me for the questions at the end. But this is the weirdest thing that I learned in veterinary school, like by far. Um, we talk about a lot of weird stuff. This, this probably takes the cake. So horses, they get this benign sort of growth sometimes inside their foot. It's called a keratoma. Basically, this is a growth of the hoof wall. And it, like instead of being on the outside, it like grows inside. And what this does is, is that A, it hurts, um, but B, it can also get infected and form this abscess. And so what you need to do is you got to just remove it, like get rid of it. Um, so there, there's different approaches. And most of the time when we think about masses, we're usually talking about surgery, right? To, to cut them out and be all sterile and, and, and uh, uh, get rid of all the, the nasty tissue and everything. Yeah, the, the preferred treatment for this condition is actually maggot debridement therapy, as in medical maggots. Like, they do a better job than surgeons do. Um, basically what they do is they eat all of the dead tissue. They leave the healthy tissue alone. And so it is amazing. And I, I never thought that we would be doing this in, you know, like 2021, but here we are. Um, and what I thought was so funny is that my professor in class said, so this is what this says on the package. The package itself says, beware, escaped maggots may upset the staff patients and or hospital administrators. So just something to keep in mind, should you ever pursue this. Um, but that's all I have for you today. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to try to answer those. Thank you all for, for listening. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I like that you have several bugs that we can consider to be award-winning bugs. So maybe next time you see fruit flies flying around your house, you can remind yourself that while it is a pest in your home, it is also an award-winning bug for all of the really great benefits that we have reached from research done on them. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, we mentioned in our chat, I don't know if you attended last year, Kristen, but we did have a medical grade maggot presentation and Skelly included the link 
for us. But awesome. they were talking about how they grow and harvest them and what they can be used for. And it is really amazing. It's what a good job they do. That's so cool. That's, that's really cool. I think if I were to ever personally need maggot, maggot therapy, um, I would have some serious, like, psychological uh, uh, challenges that I would need to overcome in order to, to do that. Like I know in my head that yes, this is ideal for me, but also <laughs> ah, that sounds terrifying. It's fine. No, it's great. <laughs> this is, this is the ideal. <laughs> so I had, um, a, I had a question about the mosquitoes. Yeah. And so I know that, you know, mosquitoes have different preferences for where they live. So mm-hmm. is like, is there a percentage of mosquitoes that are considered to be vectors to people or is it kind of just like any mosquito can? That is a really, really, really good question. And so I don't know if there have been any like actual sort of sampling of the mosquitoes to figure out what percentage in this geographical area carries like X disease. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I do know that the CDC has a lot of very good maps for like disease distribution. And so like that would tell you, you know, if your area is considered like a like hot spot, you know, for this kind of disease. And like, so at least with the heartworm disease, the map that was showing you the different sort of like heat maps of it that was telling you like, okay, this is a greater disease burden. However, I don't think it was looking specifically at the mosquitoes themselves. It might have just been going by these are the number of heartworm cases that present to clinics in these areas. And so like it's different, right? We might be able to extrapolate based on, you know, like numbers of human cases of X disease in what geographic area. But that's also going to depend on what other factors are present. Like are people taking preventative measures? Like for instance, are people sleeping underneath like malaria nets, like anti, like, you know, netting um, to prevent them from getting mosquitoes. So um, that is a really good question. I'm, I would be shocked if the research was not out there, but I don't know specifically what the answer to that question is. Oh, no, thank you. But you pointing out like there's two different ways to look at it, right? Prevalence of Mm -hmm. disease in an area and then looking at that farther as to like which species is causing and contributing. Mm -hmm. And Skelly, our moderator, had made a comment about Googling a quick answer and Mm -hmm. that over 200 types of mosquitoes live in the continental U.S. and U.S. territories. And there's about 12 species that are common spreaders of germs that make people sick. So it's not a very big percentage. Mm -hmm. That is really cool. Awesome. And um, then there's a, but our, Skelly also commented about the eradicating malaria in the 50s, right? Yes. Which has its own um, issues, right? <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. Um, we're we're we, very, very, very lucky. We are very um, lucky, yes. Um, I had a question quickly about, we have a lot of mosquito questions, but mm-hmm. um, can mosquitoes carry diseases from humans to animals? And I wonder if that question is referencing, can our dogs get sick from a disease that we might have? Ooh, that is a really good question. And so you said humans to animals yes. because, um, so in theory, absolutely. Um, but it just depends on whether the dog is susceptible to that specific, um, disease. So I'm trying to think of an example. I know like some good ones that are like good for, for instance, like animal to, to human, Mm -hmm. um, but less so ones that I'm thinking about for, um, human to animal that are coming to the top of my mind right now. Okay. Um, oh no, but that's, yeah, that's, I had not thought about that. Like, is it physically possible? Absolutely. Um, however it depends on like the disease, right? So humans can't get heartworm disease. Like we, we're not able to get that, um, the dogs and, and cats can. Right. Okay. And then we had another comment from Rhonda that said in Connecticut, mosquitoes were trapped and checked for diseases several times in multiple areas. And they have Zika, I guess the equine encephalitis and West Nile virus all the way up there. So you have Zika all the way up in Connecticut. Like I knew that we were concerned about it, like on the the Southeast coast and everything, but I didn't Mm -hmm. realize that we had it. That is wow. That's, that's wild to me. Yeah, that is pretty crazy. So um, I think, oh, let's see, make sure, just one or two cases, so not a big case. So, and you got to wonder too, yeah. Um, was it, yeah, there's people people traveling who came back and it was like nearby exactly. in that area. I know um, that that kind of happened when that was going on as well. So, mm-hmm. but um, 
yeah, humans are really good at traveling and bringing things with us that can then be transmitted between each other. That is true. So yes. And that's where the cases of malaria in the U.S. come from is, is people traveling from a to somewhere that has a, a greater burden of of malaria <laughs> there. So then um, with the research that you've been doing, do you mm-hmm. have any of these bugs, if you will, that you focus on in particular yourself? Oh, my gosh. So I, I, I mostly do not focus on bugs, okay. but I do think they're really interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. In the past, I have worked with planaria before, and I've worked with um, Drosophila in my classes. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, we study mosquitoes like in vet school because they are vectors for so many different um, diseases there. But no, I don't have any like that I've like personally, you know, been like really, really actively working on. I do have some colleagues that have worked on these. Like I, oh my gosh, I forgot to tell this story. I'll tell it now because it is a great joke and kind of wild to me. So I recently (laughs) talked with a colleague who's doing his PhD uh, and he's working with mosquitoes actually. And he doesn't do this, but his lab mates do it. I was horrified when he told me this. He was telling me that like, some of his lab mates who are very invested, perhaps way too invested in their research, will let their mosquitoes blood feed from them, which I was like floored by. I was like, what are you, what? No. <laughs> so just want to clarify that you don't have to do that if you want to study mosquitoes. Like just F1, just putting that out there. Um, like Wait, That's a common story, I think, regarding mosquitoes. <laughs> Yeah, like you have those reports go, that like, have a test, little like, shop of horrors for your work. Yeah, like, like the testing of okay. the yeah. store bought is fine. <laughs> yeah. Oof. Well, um, oh, that's pretty crazy. So Rebecca Wofford shared that they had an entomology professor who did that in class. And he didn't even swell up anymore because he was so used to it. So um, do not try that at home. Because, no. Um, because, you know, you don't know that you yourself will have that reaction, but that's very interesting that some people are willing to do that. Or the mosquitoes could be carrying disease. <laughs> that too. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. protect yourself against the bugs when you can, because yes. when you need to, because you can catch things that you don't want them on, even protect though they yourself. are award-winning in their own right and the good things that they do for people. Yes. So, um, well, this was so fascinating. I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. And I have, um, if you don't mind, I have one more uh, slide to share, just and thanking everybody for coming. And so I am going to, um, if you stop screen your, sh- oh, stop yes. screen sharing, and then I'll share mine. Your and turn. I have our um, thank you for attending slide that I can share with you. And we have Bug Fest shirts available. And so Kristen, I wonder how many Bug Fest shirts do you have by any chance? <laughs> oh my gosh. It, it's gotta be like, well, I have volunteered for like 10 years. And so like, I have a shirt from each of those, but I think some right. of them, like the early ones got so worn out. Like, like I have like holes in them. <laughs> so I would wear them all the time. Um, so I especially like the ant shirt with like them crawling up the crawling side. All around. Like yeah. <laughs> so we have um, this year's theme, of course, is the bee. So we have bees on our bug fest shirts this year. So here's a website for where you can order one if you would like and join or renew your friend's museum membership and you can get one for free. And there's information on this page here for you to check that out. And we have lots of other activities. I know that we posted the link to those additional activities in the chat so you can check them out. And recordings are also available from a program if you happen to miss one. And again, we're so grateful that you could share some of your time with us here during our BugFest Plan B week. And we're very thankful to our BASF, who is our sponsor for this year as well. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Kristen, for sharing your passion about bugs and veterinary medicine. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank have you for having evening. me. Happy yeah. Bug Fest and happy Brad, y'all. Yeah. Thanks for celebrating <laughs> with me. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.